Let me ask you a question. What if every level in Tetris could be beaten by just putting any block wherever you want, and the only reason to set up large clears was a point system? What if in Metal Gear Solid, the alert system didn't cause more enemies to come in and hunt you? What if in Gears of War, you had 20 times the health and never had to reload your guns? You would never have any reason to play these games well, to engage in their systems. You would never need to think about your block placement and plan your next move. You'd have no reason to use stealth mechanics to avoid detection. You wouldn't need to use the cover system the game is built around. Games need to push you into their systems through challenge. This is challenge-based player engagement. Let's look at one of the greatest games of all time, Super Mario 64. It was revolutionary in its large open design, movement freedom, the music is great, I mean there's so much to love about it. But what keeps you playing is the gameplay. To beat Mario 64, you need to collect stars throughout the level to open doors that lead to the rest of the game, eventually unlocking the final boss door with 70 stars. Some of these stars are easy to get, but some of them are quite tricky, and if you want to progress through the game, you need to engage in the gameplay systems the developers created and start playing the game better, using things like the ground pound to eliminate fall damage from a big jump, using the triple jump to increase your jump distance and reach a faraway star, wall jumping to reach high areas. Mario 64 is a platformer with thoughtful design put into the options for the player. Some of these stars can be rather difficult for a new player to get, they're gonna fail repeatedly, missing jumps, dying, screwing up their coordination. They may get frustrated, but since the game is so fun, that frustration eventually leads to excitement and satisfaction once you finally pull off that difficult jump and get the star you've been after for 10 minutes now. And not only do you get the star, you learn new skills that can apply to the rest of your playthrough. You'll get so good at the game that when you start your second playthrough, it'll be a whole new experience for you going in as a good player. And there are so many awesome techniques and strategies to learn that you can study the game for years and become a speedrunner if you want. Now, close your eyes for a moment and imagine a Mario 64 where every star is on the ground. Maybe not every star, but all stars needed to progress and beat the game. Enter this world and just run around picking up the stars on the ground and then move on to the next world and repeat. Would Mario 64 be considered a great game if that were the case? The systems would still be there, you could still triple jump and wall jump and all that cool stuff, but there would be no actual reason to use it. Most people would play the game never learning the interesting systems or seeing all the coolest areas, and they would think it was really basic and boring. And it would be pretty ridiculous to then scold those people and say, well, why aren't you exploring the world and using all the cool jumping mechanics? There's so much depth, you're choosing to play the game in a boring way. If Mario 64 were designed like that, and players came away thinking the game was pretty boring, would you blame the players for not trying to have fun? Or would you blame the game for not pushing the players into its fun systems? The challenge involved in collecting the required stars is what drives the player to engage in the game's systems and fall in love with the gameplay through experimentation, through creative problem solving, through mastery of the controls, through failure and success. Good games push you into their systems. I'm not saying there aren't exceptions, but if you think of the best games of all time, you'll find that the majority of them directly connect their gameplay systems with challenge. Challenge-based gameplay isn't only for games with a focus on action or platforming. We can apply this to Resident Evil. What is involved in enjoying the Resident Evil experience for the first time? Exploring the map in search of important items and resources. Avoiding combat when possible because you don't have a lot of ammo, which plays into the tension and fear. Making smart decisions in the management of your inventory. If you can only hold 8 items, or 6 in the case of Chris, you can't run around with 80% of your inventory filled with weapons and ammo. You won't have room for keys or puzzle items. You can't play over cautiously with half an inventory of health items for the same reason. The challenge in Resident Evil doesn't come from the action or the deadliness of the zombies. It comes from your inventory, exploration, puzzle solving, resource management, and if you're not used to them, the controls. Now, let's imagine the first time you play Resident Evil, they give you a grenade launcher with 200 rounds. What effect would that have on the game? You would never fear a zombie encounter, you could kill every single enemy easily, you wouldn't need any other weapons, so your inventory space is freer, so you don't have to think about that either. You would never take damage, making health items irrelevant, further freeing up the inventory. You'd have less reason to explore the maps because you don't need any resources. Basically, the entire game breaks down because the challenge is gone. And without the challenge, there's no reason to engage in the survival systems. 
Could you blame people for thinking Resident Evil sucks if that's how it was? I'm sure there's people who would still enjoy it, just running around blasting enemies that stand no chance and never having to think about anything. And you can do that once you unlock the infinite rocket launcher, but you gotta actually play the game first. Getting that rocket launcher is your reward for mastering the game's systems and becoming a good Resident Evil player, so good that you can beat the game in under 3 hours. This isn't a new concept, but it's a topic that's been in discussion more lately, especially on my channel with the success of Doom Eternal and videos I've made on Titanfall 2 and Devil May Cry 5. If this is the first time you've seen a video on my channel, at the time of making this video, my channel is mostly known for my coverage of Doom Eternal. Not the story or the art or news, but analysis of the gameplay, enemy AI, weapon strategies, and how the game leans into its systems. It's a game that has very deliberate design decisions behind it. Being a good Doom Eternal player means that you use a variety of weapons, stay very mobile, watch your equipment charges, master the strategies behind taking down different kinds of enemies. The game uses the first few levels to show you some of these systems and get you out of lazy habits, by giving you a low ammo capacity at the start so you use more than one gun, and with a weak point targeting system that incentivizes you to use different mods and put the odds more in your favor. You don't have to do these things, but the game will be much smoother if you do, and you'll be involved in a very active gameplay experience. As the game loosens up on these restrictions, you'll unlock higher ammo capacities and be able to rely more on your weapons of choice. But by that time, you've already experienced the benefit of cycling through different weapons, so you probably won't. The game pushes you just enough to let you fall in love with the systems they're showing you, and then gives you the freedom to continue using those systems if you so choose once you advance past the first levels. You start meeting different enemies that encourage you to continue engaging in these systems. Maybe at this point you're mostly using the sticky bombs and the plasma rifle. But then there's the Prowler, a quick teleporting enemy that harasses at a distance and clobbers you up close. He's fast, evasive, and hard to target. Then you realize that the meat hook on the super shotgun causes him to freeze in place, and an up-close double barrel shot instantly kills him. It's not the only way, but if you start using the meat hook when you see Prowlers, you're getting used to even more weapon switching, and now you're flying around the arena with the meat hook in a very deliberate way. From there, it's a very easy step in logic to start thinking about using the meat hook as a killing blow for enemies that are close to death, using it to escape a dangerous situation, using it to get airborne over the battlefield. Once you get the ballista, you can one-shot a prowler at a distance to stagger him, and then meat hook over to perform the glory kill and get a health bonus. The game is full of little things like this that push the player into using its interesting and creative systems, and showing them how fun the game can be if you choose to engage with them. It's not just that the options are there, it's that the options actually mean something in the gameplay. Just like with Mario 64, figuring out that you can reach a star with a wall jump is the game pushing you into its systems, and the developers are hoping that you'll end up enjoying those systems and find yourself inspired to dive deeper into them and use them creatively. If every star could be collected by ignoring the game's systems, the systems would have no reason to exist. This brings me back to Titanfall 2 and Devil May Cry 5. Admittedly, Titanfall 2 has some really awesome advanced movement mechanics. It's fast, there's sliding, wall running, sprinting doesn't cancel reload animation so there's no interrupting your speed, online multiplayer has stuff like grapple hooks. It's one of the reasons the game is so loved by its community. Because of my love for Doom Eternal, a lot of people told me I need to play the campaign of Titanfall 2. I'm not a multiplayer fan, so the multiplayer was not suggested to me. I heard the single player campaign was great, so I checked it out. And in my video I said that yes, the movement is great, the guns feel good to use, the levels are cool, but the enemy variety is severely lacking and the AI is straight up bad. The AI issue is huge, because in a game where the player has so much mobility and power, the enemies need to be smart enough to deal with it. The enemies in Titanfall 2 just kinda stand there like idiots, and the solution to most combat encounters is just barge into the room and blast everyone in the chest. Yes, the game has really cool systems of advanced movement, which are showcased in the multiplayer, but if the AI is so bad that advanced movement isn't even slightly necessary, what's the point? If your response is, because the movement mechanics are fun to do, right, I hear you, I agree they are fun, but if they're ultimately meaningless, that fun is pretty fleeting. It's like telling the Mario player that they should be wall jumping and exploring because it's fun, even if every star needed to win is on the ground. It's a failure of game design, not the player. The same issue is present in Devil May Cry 5. 
The game is known for its stylish combos and deep combat, but the game doesn't offer new players difficulty options higher than normal on their first playthrough. And that first playthrough is filled with non-aggressive enemies with low health that can be killed by mashing one attack button. On top of that, it has a bunch of orbs that let you revive if you die, and the game gives you 100,000 red orbs at the start to unlock your abilities, so you don't even have the incentive to do stylish combos to gain more orbs. You already have every ability you need, and there isn't even a reason to use those abilities since the game is so easy. The criticism I get from this is that I'm supposed to be trying to fill up my style meter, but the style meter doesn't mean anything. If I just wanted a combo simulator, that would be fine, but I want a well-crafted campaign that challenges me and has in-game benefits to engaging with its systems. Games should make a player fall in love with how it's supposed to be played, not assume the player is automatically going to play that way. Devil May Cry 5 has amazing systems, but its refusal to push new players into those systems leaves a lot of players thinking the game is just a boring mash fest because they don't get to the point where you unlock challenging difficulties that actually require you to play well. People need more than an arbitrary style meter on the side of the screen to feel good about doing a long flashy combo. They need to see that their long flashy combo is helping them take down that difficult enemy that's been giving them problems. And then they'll be inspired to experiment with it more, because when your brain can relate success with the mastery of the game's systems, fun, in its truest form, is bound to emerge. I know of this firsthand, because I played DMC5 all the way through on normal and was bored to tears. And then when I unlocked hard, I started to have fun, because playing the game well and doing combos became crucial to my survival. Eventually, I fell in love with the game's combat, and I was so upset that the game had sabotaged my first playthrough by not trusting me enough to handle a hard difficulty if I wanted it. In action games, a lot of the challenge comes from the AI, and AI complexity is dependent on the player's options. Doom Eternal's AI needs to be really fast and smart to deal with how crazy you can be in that game. But then a game like Dead Space doesn't need its AI to be that complex. Your mobility options are very limited, with clunky walking, you can't jump, dash, or dodge. The action is claustrophobic and uncomfortable sometimes. The enemies don't need to be anything more than creatures that scurry around and run at you. Their simple nature complements the player's options to create a solid action horror experience, one where the challenge of the game pushes you into its systems of hunting for resources and severing the limbs of monsters to disable them, deal extra damage, and conserve ammo. I could go on forever listing all the games that intelligently mold their systems into their gameplay. Street Fighter would suck if all you had to do to win was mash the jab button. Halo would suck if enemies weren't a threat to you. Dark Souls would suck if you could cancel your attack animations. Hell, basketball would suck if you never had to pass the ball to your teammates. I'll bet you that the majority of games you've ever enjoyed have functioned like this. So, the phenomenon on my channel of people saying you want everything to be Doom Eternal when I'm simply asking games to connect challenge to their gameplay systems has been... infuriating isn't the word, not even annoying. I think it's just depressing. Doom Eternal just happens to be the best modern example of all this, and it seems to be the first time that developers have come out strongly talking about this all the time. So much that it got us talking about it ourselves and seeing it everywhere. It's what they call the fun zone, and it applies to so many games. The fact that wanting a game to be challenging enough to push a player into its systems makes some people think only of Doom Eternal proves that an entire generation has been ruined by two console cycles of games treating them like babies. Not to throw all the blame in one direction, but it's symptomatic of open world design. The whole go anywhere, do whatever you want, choose from a thousand different weapons philosophy behind some of the biggest titles of the past 10 to 15 years. I'm not saying they're all bad games by definition. I've enjoyed some open world games where you can just do everything however you want. There are some great games in that sandbox style, but it's left us with large groups of people who can't enjoy a game if it doesn't just let them run about screwing around at their own pace. Now, I don't want this to be construed as me saying that every game has to be really difficult. Difficulty is subjective. One man's challenging is another man's easy. What's more important is that the game pushes you into engaging with what makes it great, whether that be something simple or complex. Like Tetris, very simple game, easy in the starting levels. You don't have to rack your brain and practice to figure out the basics, but you certainly can't just mash your fingers randomly on the buttons and find success. You aren't going to find yourself in the later levels of Tetris without 
without understanding how to play. I also don't want people to think that I'm looking down on those who enjoy incredibly easy experiences where they can just casually fly through a game without learning anything. That's fine, have fun, but I don't think it's good for that to be the goal at the center of a game's design. If they want to offer a super easy difficulty level for people who want absolutely nothing demanded of them, fine by me. God of War 2018 has an easy mode that can literally be completed by a corpse, but it's a disservice to your game if you're not going to offer a higher level experience to everyone else. I'll leave you with this. Next time you're playing a game, be it old or new, Take a moment to appreciate if the game has good systems and if you're being pushed into them. Most of the time, that will be the case. And if the game isn't doing that, think about what could be done to make it better. You'll be a more discerning player and you'll start to appreciate the games you love even more. Thank you for watching. I enjoy these design discussions very much. I invite you to check out other videos on my channel if you're new here. I stream on Twitch, I have a Patreon and a merch store, and I'll be back soon with more stuff. Later.